I'm not having a good time. Like they have been violating my boundaries. They're telling me what to say in the OTFs. They're manipulating my words. I feel really bad anxiety every time I'm on camera. I'm not getting to know Dave. It was all just so phony. It's all fake. Yeah. It's the most unreal reality TV experience imaginable. It is. Yeah. Are you going through life blind? This is Eyes Wide Open with Nick Thompson. On this podcast, we share knowledge and stories that build human connection while elevating stigmatized societal issues such as mental health, holistic wellness, culture, free speech, and more. All to ensure we show up in the world with our eyes wide open. Hello, welcome to this week's episode of Eyes Wide Open. But... Before we get into this episode, I want to remind you to please leave a review if you enjoy this content. Give us a like if you're watching us on YouTube, and don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts and enjoy this show. This episode is going to be another good one, taking a look at the real behind the scenes of what goes on into producing reality TV. And we have a cast member from Farming for Love, which is the canadian equivalent of farmer wants a wife which is a fox show here in the states and Lori is coming from season one of filming that show and to the surprise of no one she did not have a great experience in fact she didn't even finish filming and decided to leave before the uh the experience was complete so we're gonna have her on today to talk about her experience and show show you a little bit behind the scenes of how she's doing um how this has impacted her mental health. We'll talk a little bit about her experience, obviously, on the show that was a dating show, what was going on when they weren't filming, what were some of the things happening that were exploitative and inhumane during filming, and then as well as some arguments that she's had with producers and production throughout the entire process. So this show just finished airing a few, um, I think it was last month, uh, up in Canada. So she's hot off the presses, hot off the experience, and we're going to get into this so that you can watch reality shows and know that sometimes what you're seeing isn't actually real. So you can be a viewer that views reality TV with your eyes wide open. Big welcome to Lori Brown today. Lori Brown is an entrepreneur. She's a professional award-winning photographer, a proud mother of two, and cast member from Farming for Love, which is the Canadian version of Farmer Wants a Wife. So Lori, thank you for coming today. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. It's my <sighs> pleasure. So, um, you know, we, we got connected over Instagram. Um, I'm sure everyone can use their imagination to figure out why. So <laughs> uh, I want to thank you for uh, coming on here today and then opening up your experience ahead of time. But before we get to that, my favorite question to start out with is what did you want to be when you were growing up and how did that, or in your case, how did that not change from the time you were a young kid all the way till now? Um, yeah, it's funny when I was uh, going through my old diaries from grade, I think it was grade seven, I found uh, a journal entry that said, when I grow up, I want to be a professional photographer. And so uh, I did also want to be a figure skater. <laughs> I cannot skate. Um, so I, I, I did. It's a minor on detail. <laughs> yeah, it's not important. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah. <laughs> so that's so interesting. Cause usually when I ask that question, it would be like a photographer, a writer, a figure skater. And then I ended up working in corporate America or yeah. I ended up, you know, that it's usually not exactly what you are. Your bright eyed, you know, the world is your oyster child view of the world is. You know, I, I also wanted to be an actress and I did end up going to school for performing arts and studying, oh. um, acting for film and TV. So that was something I, I thought I wanted to do until I actually, you know, started to do it. And then I was like, oh, this lifestyle is not for me. I actually wanted to be a filmmaker from the time I was probably like 11 or 12 all the way up until I would probably still do it if I had the opportunity now. <laughs> <laughs> dream. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, in yeah. eighth grade, I was like, I was voted most likely to be famous. Just never thought it would be for a reality show. I thought right? it'd be something. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, you know, something. the film industry is, is interesting because it's, it's very, it's very difficult when you're trying to have a good work-life balance because you can be, you know, you start shooting and then you don't know when you're going to wrap. Sometimes you're going all night long. And so it's hard to plan yep. for life and it's definitely hard to raise kids that way. So it just wasn't for me. Yeah. So you actually, you had kids 
at the moment you decided you wanted to be an actor or actress? Yeah, I had already had kids when I um, when I went to school, and oh. I fell in love more with the improv um, side of acting, not so much the you know scripted. So it's funny that I ended up on reality TV because I was interested in unscripted, but it's not the same, not a, not at all. No. <laughs> Even though there is some acting required in some instances on reality TV. My, um, I had to act out an entire scene in, in our show in love is blind Yeah, because they want, yeah, they wanted, um, they wanted something that happened off camera to be part of something that happened on camera. And it's just well, totally ridiculous. A, a lot of people don't know this, but my entire exit from the show was scripted. Um, so they fed me lines and I said the lines. And we're going to dive into that. But before we do, how did you end up on the show? Like what did they reach out to you? Did you apply? Um, You know, I hear more and more that they actually reach out to people and they, they have you sort of scouted more so than any of the people that are applying. Yeah. um, So I wasn't scouted. I applied. It was, I think 11 PM at night. Um, And I, I had kind of a a, tick, a viral TikTok channel. I talked about my dating woes, my dating horror stories. There are a lot of them. <laughs> so my friends were kind of following my journey of trying to find love in this very blue collar small town that I just moved to. And so a friend sent me this link and she said, oh, this new show is uh, filming. You should you should totally apply. You know, you could date this farm. And I was like, oh, that's ridiculous. And it was, it was very <laughs> late. It was very late. And I was like, you know what? You know what? Fuck it. For fun. I'll just apply. And so I went on and, you know, they needed photos, full body headshots. They wanted a video and I just, I had no makeup on. It was dark. It was just in my bathroom and I just recorded a quick 30 second video. Oh, wow. Um, And then I hit submit. And the very next morning I had the casting um, producer reach out to me saying, we want to do um, a video interview with you. And then it was from there, they went through all the steps and, you know, there's the, they have to do a background check and a psychological assessment, you know, make sure you're not crazy pants. I'm sure I'm, I'm surprised I'm passed, honestly. <laughs> well, you, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to do with the UCAN foundation is get access to our psych evaluations because I think they are actually, I have reason to believe that they're actually using these in the manner of production and who they're casting and whose, whose triggers they can push and yeah. who they can, you know, get in, in, you know, a heightened state of fight or flight and then manipulate. But, um, that's, a that's a, a task to try and get. Cause apparently here, at least for love is blind, we signed away our rights to our psych evaluations, which violates our HIPAA laws, which is crazy. I know there's something fishy with this, with the background checks and the psych evals, because there was a girl that was cast in our farm who, um, who they ended up editing her out completely out of the show because she turned out to be very racist and very, oh my gosh. Yeah. So they, they ended up cutting all her footage. Like they edited her out of group shots. Like they made it so that it looked like she never existed. Wow. Um, and so I don't even know if I'm allowed to say that out loud, but, um, you know, the whole process was very strange. They asked questions like, Oh, have you ever, you know, do you ever have anxiety or how would you feel if, you know, the public knew who you were or something like that. And so, you know, I went through all those hoops and then, um, and then they actually submit all the daters profiles to the farmer. And then the farmer chooses their top. um, In my case, it was top seven daters to go on. And then I, so yeah, that was my, my process of how I got there. Did you have any idea who you were picked by or who your farmer was going to be before you were filming? I think they originally had six farmers and I applied for him specifically. He lives mm. close to me. He's a similar age as me. Um, and so, you know, that's, that was my practical. Right. <laughs> How long was your casting process, by the way, it's from that night at 11 PM in your bathroom all the way till boom, you're on set. I knew that I was going to be cast long before I ended up on set on set officially, but I think it was only like less than three months for sure. It wasn't very long. 
That's yeah. yeah, that's actually, that's pretty quick. I think mine was, mine was like six, about six months, yeah. maybe a little less than six months for love is blind. They had casted the show before COVID season two. Oh, and so, okay. yeah. So they were like casting people, starting, stopping all through that. And people fell off cause they got in relationships or didn't want to do it anymore or whatever that might be too. So it's interesting. I'm, I'm always curious about that. Well, I applied late. So they were doing this last rush of casting. Um, they were, you know, I don't think they did a great job advertising and I know it was the first season of the show in, in Canada, other than the fr- there's a French Canadian version and you know, it is oh. wildly popular all over the world in Australia and the UK. And, and I know, I think there's been one or two seasons in the U S I, I don't know for sure, but so um, the first, the first season just finished maybe two months ago, maybe even oh, okay. less than that. Yeah. Yeah, I know that they, I feel like they filmed a season back in like the early 2000s that didn't uh, take off um, or just didn't get the reception that they had hoped. But, but you know, it was the, the show when they were casting, it wasn't really well known. So they kept putting out right. new calls for new, um, new applicants. And so I was just kind of that last, you know, batch that went through it. Timing, timing. I find this, so I, I think I told you, it's like, I, I haven't watched any of the the farmer shows fully, but I've seen bits and pieces of it while it was on TV and I was cooking or something. And it is, it is a very, it's very similar to a lot of shows, but also very different from, yes. from a lot of dating shows. So, so what was it like when you got there and, and what, what did they tell you to expect? And then I'm very curious, yeah. how did those not line up? I'm making an <laughs> assumption they didn't line up. They did not. So I will tell you <laughs> in the casting, they said that we we're anti-bachelor. Very... <laughs> That's what they said to us too. Really? <laughs> yeah. We're not we're... looking for bachelors and bachelorettes. Yeah. They said we are, what did they say? We're very underproduced, whereas the bachelor is very overproduced. And so mm-hmm. I was expecting to be able to say what I wanted to say and be myself and represent myself in a really authentic way. If anyone that knows me can, can tell you, I am who I am, like it or not. Like yeah. I am you know, if I'm you don't like way. me, yeah, I'm unlikable to some and lovable to others, but I just always want to be m- me. And I want what comes mm-hmm. out of my mouth to be my, from my own thoughts, from right. my own. Yeah. It's important to me to have integrity. And so first day of filming. Well, and I'll say to it, that is a hard thing to have. And I, I feel the same way. And that was my mindset going in was, Hey, I'm going to go into this. I'm cool. If I go home the first day, cause I don't connect with anyone. I'm cool. If I find my partner and get married, but I even said this during my interview, I'm like, you will not get me to say and do things that are out of character. So exactly. if that's what you're looking for, I'm not your guy. Yeah. And I, and I said that to myself too. I said, they can't make me say, like, I, I thought, Oh, like there's people on TV that get bad edits. Right. Yes. And I thought you can't give me a bad edit if I'm in control of everything that comes out of my mouth. But I was so, and, so wrong about that. <laughs> and you know, it's crazy. And this is what I say to people. It's like, you go in, like I read my contract. It's 30 pages, 28 pages. I read my contract. I saw the part where they say, we can misrepresent you. We can defame you, blah, blah, blah. You have yeah. no recourse. And I read that and I was like, I'm not going to say anything crazy. I'm not going to go right. on and be like, you know, <laughs> saying crazy conspiracy or, or, you know, mistreat people. Cause I treat people well. Yeah. So you do have that idea going in there. And that's where I think the people who are like, well, you signed up for it. I think that's their, their mentality is yeah. that they're like, well, I wouldn't say or do that. Exactly. But when it's out of context, out of scene, Franken biting, all these other things, yeah. you really have no idea what your edit's going to look like. And you're not a part of the editing process either. It's funny that you say that because first day of filming immediately, my anxiety, just based on the way they would um, pose questions to you in the OTFs, I don't, I don't know if OTFs on the are flies. the on the fly interviews yeah. for those that don't know. So on, the thing with on the flies is that you have to speak as though it's present tense, which is, yes, I'm dumb. And I have a really hard time with that. Um, and then they pose questions in a way that to get a certain answer out of you mm-hmm. and it's questions or prompts that things that you would never think to say yourself. And so what I started doing first episode is because I got so freaked out is I started answering all their questions and saying everything in this long, unbroken monologue. And I Mm. wouldn't add pauses because I was so scared of them cutting my audio and using it somewhere else 
or chopping and changing things. So I had, my, it was crazy. I'm sure when they were editing, they were like, this bitch is crazy. Cause it was just blah, 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 blah. good for you though. <laughs> you, you know, what's funny. I don't know if you, if you watched my love is blind season, but I did. Yeah. I had, I had the same mentality on my wedding. Cause we had decided we were going to say yes shortly before the wedding and, uh, <clears throat> or the ceremony. And I remember I was like, I know they're going to try and edit this and they're going to try and cut this. So as soon as the, the minister, asks i'm gonna just say i do where there's no time they made a whole episode cliffhanger out of it with editing <laughs> even though i gave him nothing i was like yeah. i'm specifically like i am gonna almost jump on his words so that they can't edit this and make it look anything other than what it was yeah which was a confident yes yeah and so it's just very like they can do it and they, they know do. How. they got the magic and especially now with ai technology they can do so much more than you well, they own our likeness here. too yeah, it's really nerve wracking though, because then suddenly you're, you have this like awareness is kind of, you know, I'm, I'm in control, but I'm actually not in control. And so, yeah, they, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was, I sheared a sheep. I was the only one that wanted to shear the sheep. It's a lot harder than it looks. But after in the OTS, they said, you know, do you think it turned Dave on that you sheared a sheep? And this is just like such a benign thing, but like, Nowhere in my mind would I think that it would arouse someone to watch someone shear a sheep, but they took that audio and they, and they used it in the show and it just looks so stupid. Like, it's just like, that's not, Jeez. it didn't come from me. You know, that's like, that came from context. a producer. Yeah. Oh my gosh. What was it like when you first got there? Did you, did you have to like cut yourself off from society or were you able to, Okay. Yeah. What was that like? Well, let's go back in time a little bit because I actually wanted to quit the show before I even started filming. Um, okay. I'm a single mom. I've got two kids and I saved up for a ton of time to take my kids to Disneyland. And, and you we were, were self-employed photographer, right? At, at this time yeah. I was self-employed and I was also working. Um, I was a project manager at the time. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. For a for completely unrelated industry that I ended up hating. But anyway, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> So I planned this huge trip, cost a fortune, you know, and I said, we were, they were doing the wardrobe stuff and I don't know what your wardrobe process is like, but they didn't pay us any money. They just said, you have to have all these clothes that fit all these different activities and you have to send us pictures and we have to approve them. That's and how mine so, was. Yeah. And so it's great. I'm a single mom. I'm like, okay, fine. Like I live in Dan tees and jeans. Obviously you can't have logos or anything. So I had to go buy a whole new wardrobe. And I did too. Yeah. Oh, it's such, so stupid. Um, Which by choice too, partially by choice, but like, I'm like, oh, I, you know, I need to have a fresh suit. It needs yeah. to be fitted. I need to have a couple cool shirts that like kind of express my personality. Yeah. I needed cocktail dresses. I don't, I'm a, I'm a mom. Like I don't walk around in cocktail dresses and whatnot. So, and then farm, we're, is a farm show. So you have to have farm <laughs> stuff. Like I am not get, a like, farmer. Overalls? <laughs> yeah, I did bring my overalls. Um, yeah, like boots and, and shoes that you can get muddy and poopy in. It's yeah, it was, it was a huge, it was a huge list of like very varied clothing. And so the wardrobe department was like, okay, you have to send us all your clothing and we have to approve it. And I said, well, you need to, we need to do this soon because I'm going to Disney. And then the day after I get back from Disney is filming. Well, they, they, they weren't, they were just stalling. And I was like, I gotta, I'm leaving. And when I'm in Disneyland, I don't want calls. I don't want texts. I don't want emails. I'm You're with your a family. Lot. Yeah. This is a family trip. I'm spending time with my kids. So I'm in Disney and my phone is just blowing up. I'm getting texts. They text. don't care. They don't give a shit about you. You're, you're a product. They're, they're yep. I was getting texts and calls and, and calls and texts and email and email and email. And finally I lost it. And I was like, I told you, I told every person on the production team not to bother me while I'm in Disney and you haven't respected my boundaries. So I don't mm -hmm. want to do the show. And, um, mm. they freaked out. And so they were like, okay, for now on, you'll only have one point of contact. It was my story producer. And so like, you know, this is the only person that'll contact you from now on. Everything will be fielded through them. And, um, and so I was like, okay, like, you know, respect my, my boundaries and my time, and my family. And so I did agree to go on the show. And then we get there and we film the first episode. And the first episode is all the daters and all the farmers. Like it was like a big group. And where did you guys film? Was this near your home? Like, what did you do with your kids? 
I, I can't even finding a home for my dog for three weeks <laughs> while we were filming the pods in Mexico was incredibly stressful. For yeah. Me, so I can't even imagine. Well, I freaked out a little bit, but um, my mom is retired. So okay. I was really lucky that she just moved into my house and just uh, just took my kids and my kids are a little bit older. They're not li- not little, little. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a lot. But um, but, you know, it was still, you know, I'm, she's taking time out of her life and and to go. And so filming was not it wasn't far. I had to I don't know if you know anything about my geography, but I'm on Vancouver Island. And um, and so filming the first episode was in Vancouver. So it's a ferry boat or a, they, they tried to fly me, but I had just flown back from Disney on the world's worst flight. The plane hit the ground so hard that everyone screamed and the captain apologized. And I was just like, I don't want to take another flight for a while. So I'm gonna take- I've had those kinds of flights. They're terrifying. Yeah. I had one where we were coming in like this and I'm like, um, oh, sure no. the wing or the wheels is going to hit first. Yeah. <laughs> those are scary. I'm not a good flyer in general, but so like this flight home and it was a st- storm. It was like this, you know, crazy storm that came in and I was just like, I'm just good on flying for a little bit. I just need to stay on. Earth. I'll swim. Yeah. <laughs> I'll swim. <laughs> yeah. But they booked me a flight without asking me. And I said, I'm not getting on that plane. And so they're like, okay. So they canceled my flight and then booked me a ferry, a ferry ticket. So first tick, uh, first episode was filmed in Vancouver, um, on this like rented farm place and you know it's the f- where'd they get the farmers did they actually find were they real farmers real they farmers real farmers okay. yeah so like, I there's only so see- many things you can fake on these shows like if you're doing <laughs> a show about farmers i think you need farmers the farmers were authentic i will say okay. I, they went to like farmers markets and different like farm events and they scouted them interesting and i know that dave my my farmer he he wasn't keen on it. He, they really had to harass him into doing it. And he's much some like very similar personality to me in that, you know, he's just a regular person who just ended up on the show and, and it turned out kind of not how he thought. And I don't want to speak for him, but yeah, yeah. You know, he, I think he, I could tell he had a really hard time with some of the, some of the ways, you know, the producers were trying to create situations which they do. They all manufacture these people have the idea that you're being followed around like a documentary film crew. Yeah. No, is, is no, like every situation you're told where you're going, who you're going with, what you're doing, what you're talking about. You don't yeah. have a, a whole lot of freedom in, in these scenarios. You know, I had a really hard time because we, you know, we're cut off. And this is a big issue is that they promised me that I would be able to speak to my kids while we were filming and they didn't make good on that promise. And so I felt really disconnected. And there was one situation where I was trying to fill out permission forms. It was the first week of school and I have to fill out all these forms to let my kids, you know, use the computers and was this last year? Yeah. A year ago. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is exact, pretty much exactly a year ago. And, uh, and my handler, for lack of a better word, I don't know what you guys called them, but we had handlers, like, cause I we're cattle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was like, no, give me your phone. Give me your phone. Like we got to go. And I'm like, like, I gotta do this. I have to, I have Did to you give it. your phone up for the whole time or how, how long they were you? Us, yeah. They let us have it back for like five, 15 minute in, uh, t- times per day, but they, they only gave me my phone back while my kids were in school. So school days. Do you think that was by design? I don't know. You know, I wonder it was, we, I had a lot of arguments with the producer about that. It was a big issue. Um, and that really also contributed to my desire to, to leave the show because, you know, I've, I'm sure lots of people haven't seen it. I left voluntarily pretty early on when I recognized how kind of, how toxic the environment was. Mm. And when you were, where were you staying and, and did you get your phone? They didn't give you your phone at night. Like I'm, I I know what my experience was. I've heard plenty of others, but what, where were you? What were, where were you staying? What were you allowed to do? Not allowed to do. So there was five farmers all throughout British Columbia and they all had their own farms. So the daters would go to the farmer's farms in our situation. um, We were put in this rental house on the farm property there was five girls in this tiny house with one bathroom. Of course. There's only it was a nightmare. Bathroom. 
and the house had an active hornet's nest inside of the house. Jeez. I'm not even exaggerating. There was hornets everywhere. And they said, oh, we did spray. So there was also dead bugs everywhere. My The carpet of my room was just covered in dead insects. And I was waking up in the middle of the night every night having an asthma attack because I, I don't know if it was from the spray, from the chemicals that they... I mean, I was going to say those are toxic sprays. I don't even think you're supposed to use them inside. It was bad. And I also woke up with rashes like under my eyes. Like, yeah. And a couple oh other gosh. girls did too. They had They woke up with rashes and it was not... A great environment but you know they don't care <laughs> no they really don't they they're they're literally like i mean i can't even think of what to describe them but any corner they can it's capitalism is what it is it's like it is any yeah. corner they can cut to save a buck yeah. any person they can exploit to make a buck it's gonna happen let me tell you our towels didn't even absorb water. <laughs> like they, oh my they repelled God. water. I was like, you can at least splurge on like, you know, towels that. Towels are like $4 at Costco. They, like, they have one job. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's so crazy. So you were bad. staying in that house. How long, how long were you there in that house? And what did they, when they send you back to the house, they just not give you your phone or was it just too late? They, they sent us to the house, but our handler had our phones for the entire time and she would sit there and say okay you can use your phone now for whatever the designated time was and then she would sit there and then she'd be like give me your phone back um the house had no internet access they cut off all internet access to the house so even they said like bring movies or something and i i just didn't think about it but luckily there was a a box set of the of friends in the house so i watched those on my laptop because i was like can't go wrong with friends no and i was just like what do i do i'm going crazy like you know especially when you're used to like having your phone like the dopamine oh yeah yeah that's exactly it and i didn't vibe with the girls in the house not to say that they weren't nice people just very different places in life um very different personality types you know i'm a mom um and a lot of them lived with their family still um so it was just it wasn't fun (laughs) did they put you in houses with people that were paired with different farmers no they were all for the same you're all dating the same farmer oh yeah so you're living with are they recording you that that's crazy we had audio on our mic on sometimes but they would come into the house and record us uh first like specifically how do i word that like it was like scheduled not scheduled but we would know when we were being recorded normally and it was like these these girls would be one way and then as soon as the cameras would start rolling they'd be like oh and it just felt so disingenuous to me um that's what i had a really hard time with is it's just it was all just so phony it's all fake yeah. It's the most unreal reality TV experience imaginable. It's, it is, yeah. What was your relationship like? What was his, was his name Dave, right? Dave, yeah. Dave. What was your relationship like with Dave? How long did you stay? I barely talked to the guy. Oh, they, wow. So we had the first episode was five-minute speed dates. And, you know... You're sitting there. It's the first time you're meeting. It's the first time you're also like on camera. So it's very awkward. You're very nervous and you're just trying to like get to know this person, but you only have five minutes. And then after that you leave and you're separated and you don't get to see them until like the next scheduled. In my case, it was just these series of group dates and the girls that I, that were also there on my farm are, they were all very dominant personality types where it's like they all were talking over each other there was just so much interrupting um that i just kind of sunk into the background and they cut so much footage because there was times where we'd be on a group date and everyone would be talking and i would get so overstimulated that i would get up and walk away and i didn't participate in the rest of the dates it was weird (laughs) yeah i mean i can't Thankfully, I didn't have to do group dates in my experience, but I can't imagine that would be a scenario I thrive in either. Too much, too much stimulus. Yeah. And and Dave was not Mr. 
charisma, you know, um, he's a pretty quiet, relaxed guy. And so the producers were feeding him lines. They're like, Dave, why don't you ask the girls about this? Why don't you say this? And in my head, I just, I'm like a very no bullshit personality. And I just laughed. I'm just like, this is so stupid. Like you have to tell him what to say. And then. Cause and he then didn't even really want to be there in the first place. It exactly. sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, they really hyped it up. Like this would be a great opportunity to showcase your farm and what it does for the community and, and, you know, meet, make meet your person or whatever. But, you know, when you go there, you're like, this is not what what it is they this all is a, say the same thing yeah this is a show this is a sh- way for your network to make money off of us that's that's yeah. all it was and so you know you kind of you lose faith yeah i talked to um someone in the bachelor nation recently just not publicly like in a private yeah. phone call that reached out um so i can't really share who obviously but um they were telling me that even in their casting process, they were told we've gotten so much better than we used to be. Uh, we, know we have this reputation and, you know, of, of, you know, being, uh, I'm saying exploitative, but we've yeah, changed. It's like the abusive relate. We've changed. <laughs> yeah. We're better now or love is blind. Like we're not looking for people that want to be on the bachelor. Like we're looking for genuine people ready for love, ready yeah. for marriage and, you know, as if someone they who they wouldn't pick 22 year olds though, like, <laughs> right. Right. <You> know? <laughs> when Just... I think that's part of like the archetype of that show specifically, and I'm sure there's similar, maybe a little different on, on your show too, but I think they have like, here's the kind of people we need. Yeah. And then they cast at least in love is blind. And these shows where there's multiple people, they cast to these, these characters that they've already created and they're not actually interested in in capturing you or your personality or you know what your day to day life actually is. They're interested in like shoving you into that character that they that they have. And in my instance, I think it was I was a little bit older than some of the other guys. I was thirty five at the time, maybe thirty six. Yeah. And um, I had my shit together. I was a successful marketing executive. Um, you know, owned a condo in Chicago. Like I have a dog. Like I have all these awesome, you know, qualities. And I think I was fitting that, oh, well, he'll definitely be one of the the people that'll get married and prove the concept works. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think they had that in mind for me too. And, and it's funny because this, you know, like single mom thing isn't really my personality at all. I'm very goofy. I'm very silly. Like, and I think, you know, on oh, you the have show. silly goose on your Instagram. Bro. Yeah, I'm just, just, I'm really silly, and I, I love improv. I love comedy. I, when I, I literally, I'm constantly writing stand up comedy bits because my like dream one day is to do comedy. But when I'm on the show, they really kind of took that away from me, and like they tried to control what I did or how I, what I said or how I came across. And I was like, you, you know, I said to them, I even said to them in one of my OTFs, I said, you would get better material from me if you stopped telling me what to say. You would get more interesting, more funny clips. Yeah. If you let me be me, but they needed this. The producer wanted to control everything so much that, that it really just took away from, it made it worse. I'm like, you're getting crappier content. Like, yeah. But that's what they want. They want that messy. They want you to be uncomfortable so that they can tell you what to say and what to talk about and, and get you saying things that you're not really comfortable saying because it's going to come across awkward. And then they can use that to position you in whatever way that they want through the editing process. It's really just, it's really just all manipulation. The entire It is so manipulative. And, and so I didn't actually watch the episodes that I was in. I started watching the show after I left because I don't want to watch myself on TV. It just felt really gross. But uh, people were sending me clips and, and they, so in my OTFs, pretty much from start to finish, they, every time she would ask me about my kids and try to get me to cry about my kids. And I did every time. And they used so many clips of me crying about my kids that people are probably like, why did she even go on the show if she's missing her kids? And it's like, first of all, my kids, I love my kids, but I'm okay to be away from them. <laughs> like, 
probably prefer it sometimes. <laughs> yeah, like I'm okay, I'm good. But they would ask these emotionally charged questions and like, oh, and you're giving up so much to be here. Talk about how much you're giving up to be here and like how hard it is to be away from your kids and stuff. And then when you're posing questions like that, of course, you're going to get an emotional reaction out of me. And so when they scripted my exit, they used all those clips to kind of um, support my my reason for exiting the show. I mean, I'm repulsed. I just want to say I'm totally repulsed by all of that. How long were you there for before you I was quit? there, I think, for two and a half weeks in total. Oh, wow. How um, long was the whole process? The whole thing was supposed to take up to six weeks. So there were seven, start off with seven girls. He eliminated two the first night. Then he eliminated another one. And after she left, I left voluntary, voluntarily. Um, so I actually had a huge screaming fight with the producer on set. We're not allowed to call it set because it's not a it set. Is set. It is <laughs> It's though. totally a set. Yeah. And where I refused to film halfway through a group date. and uh, And they were yelling at me to go back and film. And I said, no, you're not the boss of me. They're like, well, you signed this contract and you have to do this. And I said, I actually don't have to do anything. Yeah. It is very, very powerful for you to have the strength and the wherewithal to push back like that. What was the, yeah. what was that final straw that you were like, fuck this, I'm done. Okay. So we moved into the house and I, I want to be careful and I don't want to say anything disparaging about any of the girls that I was in the house with. You know, one of them has a podcast and she's taken her opportunity to talk <laughs> okay. about her experience. But um, basically, so I moved into the house, you know, there was only so many bedrooms and I, I ended up with a single bedroom and one of the girls kind of threw a fit that she couldn't have her own or she couldn't share a bedroom and i said well i'm i don't care i'll share a bedroom then i'm i don't care and so I honestly getting your own bedroom it's not that big of an ask at all like yeah. you're grown you're grown women like you i know des you deserve to have your own space right and so yeah so i didn't care i i gave up the bedroom to her but it was more just there was just a lot of conflict and so then we were um, in the house and one of the girl girls, you know, they limited our alcohol. They provided the alcohol. I don't drink. I'm sober. And so, yeah, I have a hard time with being around people who get wasted and are annoying and belligerent. And, you know, one of the girls in the ho house, and I might ask you not to, you know, but she liked to drink and, uh, and she just was not particularly nice. And so, the next, they were up all night. The girls were up all night drinking. I went to bed early and my bedroom now was next to the bathroom and it was a very old house and they were slamming the door all night long. I wasn't sleeping. So we get up the next day and the producer's like, get, get dressed, get mic'd up. We're going to film. And we're like, what are we doing? And they're like, just dress for this. And so I you know, was wearing, you know, camo pants and a, and a long sleeve shirt. And we go out and I find out that we're picking pumpkins in the blistering heat all day long so <laughs> we're picking these fucking pumpkins i don't know if you've ever picked a pumpkin for starters they're sharp yeah they're so sharp you need, so, you need like a saw or a hatchet yeah so we had tools but we didn't have gloves so my hands are scraped to shit my ankles are scraped to shit and i'm i'm sweating my ass off and i said can i have some water and the producer said, no. And I said, what? <laughs> like, I was just so shocked right. that they wouldn't give me water. And then Dave was said, you know, like he cut his hand pretty bad on the pumpkins. And he said, let me get some gloves. And can I get these girls some gloves? And the producers were like, no, like, no, like, let's just keep, keep filming. And we're, we're lugging these massive pumpkins from the, from the field onto this big flatbed truck and uh and i had this moment where i was like i am 35 goddamn years old and i'm picking pumpkins in the sun for no reason <laughs> like, you were farming for love i was like why am i doing this <laughs> yeah. so we broke for lunch and i was a vegetarian at the time and they they gave us just two options for lunch 
and one was something that I didn't like any of the ingredients and the other one was a meat thing. So I ended up having to eat this meat dish. And did they know your dietary preferences? Yeah. Yep. I went through the same thing because I, I don't eat pork. I don't eat um, chicken. I don't eat uh, gluten. And yeah. I went through the same thing. Like they knew all this and yeah. they don't care. give a shit. No. no. And then they made us eat it in this hot Ford expedition. So there was like seven, six or seven people in this black Ford expedition in the blistering sun eating lunch. And then we're t- and then, so the producer came and I said, what are we doing after lunch? And he said, picking more pumpkins. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> I said, I'm not, not doing it. And he said, well, you gotta, let's go. Right, like lunch finished. He's like, let's go. And I said, no, I said, let's go. And I said, I'm not fucking getting out of this truck. I'm done. And he said, no, you have to come. And I said, you can't tell me you, I don't actually have to do anything because I'm a human being. And I have autonomy over my own body. And he didn't like that. And we ended up getting into this screaming fight. We were yelling at each other. And then he ended up going and getting Dave to come talk to me off camera, which they didn't, they would never let they us didn't do that. let that happen. Never. But it's because I was, I was ready to leave. They wanted him to and talk. Did you and Dave have like a trustworthy relationship in any way at this point? I literally or? hadn't spoken to him at all. Like wow. other than in the, in the group dates, but the group dates, it was just all the other girls really talking to him. And I was just kind of like, you know, I'll just go fuck myself then. Like, it's like just, <laughs> <laughs> I was just kind of off in the shadows. And so I was like, this isn't really, I'm not getting anything. I'm not getting to know him and I'm not having a good time in the process. So it was kind of like, if I'm not developing a connection with him, and I'm not having a good time. They also said that filming the show was going to be like uh, adult summer camp. It, <laughs> it was super not. It was like, there's no part of this that feels like a fun summer camp. That feels like a lie they could have just left out. <laughs> a for effort. I was like, you mean like a labor camp? Because that's what it feels like. <laughs> but so then I was like, I don't want to film anymore. And so... Um, because I refused to film the rest of the day, they drove me back to um, to the farm. Were they threatening you at this point with a contract? I won't say threatening. They were choosing their words very carefully. Yes. Um, they weaponize it. They rep- and, But they were really trying to manipulate me and be like, Dave really, really, really likes you. And, and he really wants you to be here. And he was so excited that you were on the show. And like just really using like more guilt than anything to get me to stay. But I just didn't, I was like, no. Um, so Dave came talk to me off camera and he was like, yeah, he's like, I, I don't think it's fair that, you know, they, he's like, I'm not having fun either. Basically. Like I, I heard they're not letting you really talk to your kids and blah, blah, blah. And so I just said, yeah. And I'm just, I'm not into it for, for today. So they drove me back to the house and they left me there with no phone, no access to, to anything like I completely cut off. Now, did you have your ID or wallet or anything? I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They didn't take that stuff, but I couldn't go anywhere. We were out kind of, it was, we're up on this farm, like no vehicle, no phone. Um, so I was stuck. You're stuck. I was stuck. You're literally a prisoner. Yeah. And, um, and so then the girls, I went to bed, I was like mentally drained. I went to bed and then the girls all came back later and I came out into the kitchen and I was talking to them and I, I was, you know, just, they're like, why did you leave? Cause it was a big dramatic exit when they were picking pumpkins and they're like, Oh, Lori's not coming back. And they watched the, the truck drive away with me in it. They cut that footage. They didn't use it. Of course. Yeah. Of course. But, uh, but it was, all what did they say? Storyline wise, they just had them say, Oh, Lori went home or whatever. You know, when I watched, I didn't watch that episode, but I, I oh, watched right. clips, but I asked people, they said they edited that day and the following day to look like it was one day and then just pretended I never left. Wow. So the power of editing, the power of editing. So, you know, the girls came back home and they were like, why did you leave? And I said, I'm not having a good time. Like they have been violating my boundaries. They're telling me what to say in the OTFs. They're manipulating my words. I feel really bad anxiety every time I'm on camera. 
I'm not getting to know Dave. Um, and so I said, you know, I'm giving up a lot to, to be here, being away from my kids and, and earning oh, money. Just the fact the lied to you yeah. about being able to talk to your kids. Yeah. That pissed me off. And so the girls were like, well, y- you knew what you signed up for. Oh. When you're all, when your fellow victims are accusing you of. Right. <laughs> but they had their own motive for being there and I'm not going to speak to their yeah. motives, but you know, a lot of people go on these shows and they suffer through it because they have this end goal in mind of, Oh, maybe I'll get my own show or maybe I'll get brand deals or maybe I'll make money or I can be an influencer or, you know, get viewers for my podcast, yada, yada, whatever the reasons I'm not going to diss anyone's hustle. That's your own journey. But for me, that's not, that wasn't my reason for going. And so that's not what I, that wasn't mine for. either. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's exactly, I think that's the right um, message that, needs to get out there to anyone. Like if you're, if you're going on for quote, the right reasons, which I think you could make an argument, what are the right reasons for these shows considering how they're produced. But I feel like if you're, if you're going to go on a love show and you're going to, and you're doing it cause you actually want to find love and you think it might work, you have to realize all of this behind the scenes stuff is going to impact you. It's going to have a toll t- on you physically, mentally, emotionally, and you may end up with the person who maybe isn't there for the right reasons. And now you've, you've severely impacted your life in a negative way, all because you had the best intentions. Yep. And I think a lot of people do end up with someone who isn't there for the right reasons because you don't know, and you're, you're only seeing what you, what you see. And I know, each farm was slightly different. We had different producers on each farm, right? Like, cause there was five farmers. So they had their own producers, their own cameramen, their own sound guys. Like it was very much a skeleton crew on each farm, but, uh, but the, you know, they had their own producers who were running the thing. And I know that some farms had a better experience than others. And I know there was another farm that, you know, the people on that farm also didn't have a very positive experience with their producers. But you don't really know until you're in it. And so for them to say, well, you knew what you were getting, you knew what you signed up for. Like, no, like I didn't sign up to be manipulated or, you know, gaslit or, you know, like a pup. If I just felt like a puppet and, um, and when you, I have kids, right. And they didn't have kids. And I'm like, my kids are old enough to watch this show. And I want to make sure, and they're friends too. Like my kids' friends were following me on TikTok and, you know, they, they see me. I have a T, I have a 16 year old. So whatever I do and say on this show, it really has to reflect on them too, in a positive way. So they just, the girls just didn't get it. And we got into a big fight and I was like, I don't want to be here anymore. I'm just not into it. So the next morning, you know, they're like, okay, up and Adam, time to go film again. And I, I said to myself, I was like, cause they kept trying to get me to stay, you know, cause they want everybody to stay because they have to get 10 episodes. Right. And if everybody leaves when well, they have to finish their story that they're trying to tell. Exactly. They actually wanted me to go on camera. They said, you have to go on camera and tell Dave, tell Dave that you don't like him. And I said that I don't know him. I'm not going to say anything like that. Cause it's not true. They were going to villainize you. They were going to villainize that. me. And I said, no, because it's not true. And I know how it's going to look. So the, and I, but I, I'm not allowed to say the reasons that I'm actually wanting to leave because it's about production. You know, I'm not allowed mm-hmm. to say anything mean about them or negative about them, especially on camera. So the next day I said to myself, if we're filming something to do with alcohol again, I'm going to take it as my cue to leave for good. Like I'm going to say that. Like a dinner date or, or just the group setting or just, yeah. Cause the night before there was a lot of alcohol and it was, you know, that fight. Uh, and then, so they drove us to a brewery <laughs> and I thought if I have to sit here and sample all these beers with people I don't like, <laughs> I just don't want to do it. Just don't want to do it. And so, uh, I refused to film again. I refused to even go on camera. And the producer chased me down a road. I literally walked to the end of the road and she chased me and she yelled at me and said, you have to go film. You have to tell him this. I need to get my story. I need, you know, she was upset with me because, you know, I guess she's under the wire. She's got to get her story. And if I'm not 
agreeing to film, but I'm also not agreeing to leave with, uh, with a story that aligns with their narrative, you know? So it got to the point where they, I was being held hostage and she said, well, what you're going to do is you're going to go sit down and then we're going to tell Dave to tell you that he wants to talk to you. And then you guys are going to go walk over here. And then she's like, and then we'll tell you what to say. And they walked us over there and she pulled me aside into this greenhouse. And she was like, okay, I want you to say this. And I said, okay. And I walked out and I, what was it? Something about, I was missing my kids and I didn't want to stay if I, if we didn't have a long term future. And then they told, I think they told him what to say. He said, um, I have a stronger connection with one of the other girls. And I said, great, you should follow that connection. And then I, we gave a hug and I said, goodbye. Thank God you didn't give them the stuff that they wanted you to give them yeah. because they would have made you into a monster. Oh, totally. If they could have for a number of reasons. One, clearly they don't like you they because you're like standing me. up for yourself. Yeah. And two, because they want, they would have wanted to get re revenge, which is maybe one B, but then the other reason is it would have been more dramatic mm -hmm. and that's really all they care about. Yep. It really was. And it's funny because in, they knew like the producers had to be, they're talking to their higher ups about me. Like I was the problem child on the farm. And maybe it's because I, I did come from working in the film industry and where I had rights and I had, you know, meal rights and I had pay rights and I had time rights, um, to, to doing this where I'm, I'm literally, I'm just, a am like a prop basically that speaks um, you're a live prop. That's yeah. what my You Can Foundation co finder says. You're a live prop. Yeah. On these shows. And so, and so knowing that they saw me that way, you know, I, I got into discussions and I said right off the bat to, um, to, I guess you would, the head of the production company, you know, these are the things that were happening to me. These are the things that are not okay. Um, my human rights were violated, like denying me water or, protective equipment when we're doing dangerous farm chores, not okay. Food. 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 Yep. Um, and manipulating me or it, it was, if I felt like, and here's the thing I had just, not just, but I was married. I'm divorced and my, my marriage was very abusive and there was a lot of infidelity. And so after my marriage, I really worked very, very hard on setting boundaries and recognizing when I'm being emotionally manipulated or abused. And also, you know, which isn't easy work. It was, it's been hard. It's been really hard. And it's, yeah. you know, when you, when you go from being somewhat of a, a doormat to being really assertive, you kind of lose, I don't know, there's a fine line you have to walk with people in terms of not being uh, abrasive. And I haven't mastered that yet. I'm really still working on it, but I'm very just, this is the way I feel. Mm -hmm. that's it there's nothing wrong with that yeah it's I, I make some enemies sometimes people are like oh like you know I was expecting for you to just do what I wanted you to do um so when I was emailing them and I said this is you know how I'm feeling and this is wasn't okay I think they got really worried and they told all of the uh members of production because they at this point they were emailing being like oh this is when the episode's gonna air and this is what you need to know about you know what do they, you know, pre-show publicity or what, when you're allowed to announce to people that you were on the show, things like that. They were not sending me anything. I didn't hear from them at all. And then finally, just days before it was supposed to air, the head of the production company called me personally. And she was like, I really want to smooth things over. Like we gave you a really good edit. We really want you to be happy, you know, um, we, I told nobody else to bother you. We haven't been bothering you. And I said, yeah, it's all fine and dandy that you gave me a good edit. But thank you. I mean, I deserved one because I didn't do anything wrong, but right. which they normally don't care about. I'm, I know, but I said, it I mean, this is the, probably one of the most ethical thing that's ever happened in reality TV. Yeah. But I said, it doesn't take away the fact that I had a really terrible time filming. And when I got home, I went into bed and I didn't get out of bed for days. Um, I felt so mentally and emotionally psychologically drained. Like I felt like I was an empty bucket and I, my head was swirling. It was kind of hard to explain how it was like, 
I came from that world back into the real world. And it was like my brain didn't work anymore. And I didn't have the energy for my kids. And I made my mom stay a lot longer um, because I just, I couldn't go back into full mom mode. I was really, I was like in recovery almost. That's awful. And you know, I've, I've, not that this makes it feel any better. I've heard that from so many people. Um, you know, and me personally, I still feel like that. Like I feel almost like, you know, I said this to someone yesterday, like, I feel like I'm never going to be the same again. Like I'm never going to be who I was before I did that. And there's a lot of factors that go into that. But like one of them is, is just this feeling that like the whole world sees you as this character versus who you really are. And then, then, you know, with the work I'm doing and the organizing I'm doing, I constantly keep putting myself back in that space, back in the public eye, back where I'm getting misrepresented by, you know, inflammatory and sometimes defamatory headlines yeah. and commentary and people that won't talk to me talking about me, yep. which is like my biggest pet peeve. All these people commenting on, on me, my life, my relationship, my job situation, whatever that is without ever talking to me yeah, or without ever reading past the headline. And it's awful. It's to, to sell it, Cause they, the whole world's, you know, capitalism, baby. Uh, we just want to make as much money as we can off of people in whatever way that we, uh, and any way that we can. And so ethics, morality, out the window. Out the window. Doesn't exist. Comes secondary. Um, so what, okay. So now the show has been out a few months, right? You said it finished in June, I think. Is that right? I think it only finished airing a month ago. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what, what was it like? I mean, you got an apology, you got a quote, you know, those watching quote, good edit. Um, what, what's life been like since? Not good. So I had a, decently large TikTok following. I, I only joined TikTok uh, in the middle of the pandemic because I thought TikTok was for kids. And uh, so I just started... I still tell myself that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, my daughter was on it and I'm like, I'm not going to do it if you're doing it. But then I just, one day I just made a TikTok video and, it, and then I kind of went viral, viral really quickly. But then I noticed that all the producers were stalking me and making sure I didn't say anything. And and, uh, and I got just such bad anxiety about being out there. And, um, and then I was like, well, what I, what do I talk about now? And so I, I deleted all my videos and I, and I really scrubbed my social media because I was like, okay, when this airs, I don't know what kind of reception it's going to get. And, you know, I don't know, you were on Netflix, but nobody watches Canadian TV. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> watches nobody has cable so I was pretty lucky in the sense that I didn't have a whole lot of I didn't get the same uh level of you know awareness that you did right. being on Netflix which is you know which doesn't make it any less no but anything though yeah don't and discount it yeah. and so one thing is that the uh the show farming for love they they said we're not going to tag you in anything and they didn't and I and that's because they didn't, they didn't want me to, they didn't want to piss you off. They didn't want to piss me off and they didn't want me to say anything that would reflect poorly upon them. I was, I'm the, the they're like wild card. They're like, we need to just shut her up. She's, mm -hmm. she's mad. So I wasn't tagged in anything. So I didn't get all these new followers, which was kind of nice, but you know, I did get the odd person who went looking for me and messaged me and, and some people, you know, some men which I dealt with on, you know, its own scale previous, but, you know, trying to find out where you live and wanting to marry you. <laughs> I will say it that there's a lot of, I don't want to be mean, but there's a lot of people out there that don't understand like social cues, what's acceptable. Yeah. And, boundaries. Like, you know, yeah. boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. It was so it was, you know. I, I got used to that, especially being on TikTok. You know, you get the haters no matter what. You can, doesn't matter. You you could say the sky is blue, and you'll have people being like, "You're ugly," <laughs> you know. Yeah, I know it's wild, isn't it? <laughs> so crazy. It's like social media 
has completely made us as a society so disconnected from one another that the things, the way we interact now is just so absurd. It's absurd to me. I don't know. But it, yeah, you're not viewed as a human being no. through the lens of social media in so many cases. No. And people, people use it as a mask. Yeah. I mean, I, I get comments from people with no, no followers following 500 people and a picture of some random ass cat as their profile picture. <laughs> and I'm sitting there and I'm like, why are you like writing a paragraph about how much you don't like me? Like, I, and why do you think I care? Like, why do you think I care? It's, I think Brene Brown said something about how like it's the doers or there's people who do. And then there's people who criticize those who do. Um, yes. And so, you know, once you have a, once you, are aware of that it doesn't really bother you because you're like okay well this is their po- purpose or this is you know what they're right. here for but you know to i found this um farming for love facebook group it was a sort of a <laughs> fan group for people who, who like the show and to see what they post and they and they would all talk they would have discussions about what they thought of people and how they perceived things going from their mm-hmm. viewer position that was so strange to me because i'm like that's not what happened that's not what happened they, and they think they know they oh they're pot and they're like, like that why person, do they think they know yeah they're like oh she's she's so bossy and he's so needy and and like you don't know you don't know i very quickly decided i was never going on reddit after love is oh, blind reddit, came out yeah. and not that not that i was ever on reddit but i i, I actually i just think it's like this this dark like i think reddit is the dark web it is like, that's where that's where people go to just have no rules and, and where the no, incels go no, <laughs> <laughs> right exactly yeah. but man like the stuff people come up with is just crazy yeah. it's just totally nuts there was a reddit thread that had a whole conspiracy that i had an affair and was at brunch with the person i had an affair <laughs> with who was my friend from england that i've known for 10 years who was in town and we were in a group yeah and it was just like, it took off. Like I started getting all these hate messages. Wow. You cheated. You're a cheater. How could you do this to her? Like what? Really? I didn't even know. Yeah. I didn't even know what was going on at first. So how'd you it find took out me a day it because to... of the Reddit? Like, I don't even really remember now that I think about it, but my friends started getting hate too. Oh. Like they, they somehow managed to go onto my Instagram from like 2017 when I went and visited her in England and find out who she is. But what they didn't manage to do was realize, oh, maybe they've been friends for a long That's time. That's crazy. That's like people can't think past like their initial reaction. Yeah, but I also think when people post this stuff, it's because they themselves want the views or they want the attention. They want to be shared. It's like this. Everyone's clamoring for fame or fi- clamoring to feel important or like significant in some way. And uh and I think that's one of the biggest issues with, you know, reality TV, but also just society in general is, yeah, it's, it's all very much a show. It is. It's, I mean, it goes and ties in with social media too. Yeah. So last thing I'll ask you before I'll, I'll turn it over to you to ask me any questions. Um, what would you recommend? So season two of farming for love, I keep wanting to say farmer wants a wife <laughs> yeah. farming for love is casting right now. I actually went on their Instagram page and can confirm that myself because they have the application right in their profile. Someone's applying, someone's been cast, someone's thinking about any of it. What advice do you have to them? What would you say to them if they called you and asked you for advice? So I actually did have someone reach out to me recently on Instagram saying that they were considering applying. And what I told them is, you know, if, if you think that it could make your life better in some way, then go for it. But these are all the risks and there's a, a, a thousand ways it could make your life worse and maybe one or two ways it could make your life better. And, um, and those just aren't great odds. Like, you know, it could really damage your reputation. It could harm your ability to earn money. It could harm your relationships with future potential romantic partners or friends and family or your community, you know, so many things like, or you could maybe find love and maybe get some followers that might help with your business. And like, that's it pretty much. But odds are like, it's unlikely you're going to find love out of my season. Only one couple is together. And, uh, out of 
you know, five farmers. Um, one of the farmers did find love, but sh- not on the show. <laughs> she, they introduced a friend of hers onto the show and she, you know, they stayed together, but she knew him prior to the show. Oh, wow. Um, and so, yeah, there's, and it's, and then given how little, uh, viewership the show has, because it is on cable, they are putting it on Crave. I don't know. I don't think you guys have Crave there. It's kind of like Hulu. I think we do actually. Oh, do you? But, okay. But beware, and they probably won't tell you this. So this is happening right now to another cast member that I had from a different show on. Um, her name's Alyssa Barmundi, and she was on Married at First Sight in Australia. They just dropped it here in the U.S. on Lifetime and didn't tell anyone in the cast. So they're just getting all the hate all over again that they got six months ago. It's And no support. Yeah, I'm worried because you know it, when it was on cable TV – the only people that were watching it were my friends and family. <laughs> but then when it goes on a streaming service, that makes your um, audience so much bigger than, you know, nowadays everyone has streaming. Very few people still have cable. So I know it's going to change things. And I know that there might be this new wave of interest over the show once that does happen. Um, so I'm preparing a little bit, but I, yeah, I would just say anyone who's considering going on any reality TV show to just really weigh out whether your privacy and, and all of the risks associated are really worth the potential, um, outcome, best case scenario. I will second that. Um, I have a lot of people that have asked me similar questions and I I don't tell them what to do, but I tell them what to think about kind of similar to what you're doing. And I'll say too, like the, you're, I wanted, I never wanted to quit my career. I liked my job. I liked my career. Um, You know, I I got laid off and I've struggled to find work and I don't want to be an influencer. I don't even really care about being famous. I like having my podcast. I don't, I pay for it myself. People think I'm making shit tons of money. I pay for this myself because I think that the things I'm talking about, whether it be this or mental health or, you know, just overall wellness are really important. And I think we need to have more honest conversations about it because we we're all propagandized to support capitalism. And one of the things that I think is so interesting to me is I didn't get a bad edit in, you know, by and large people were relatively supportive at first, (laughs) but (laughs) it changes. But, but the fact that now in my life, I have to have separate meetings with HR for job interviews or with the hiring manager where they're asking me questions like, well, if, how do you handle a customer interaction when they recognize you from the show to direct it back to business? What are you going to do if you have to meet with an analyst? Because I'm customer facing in my type of marketing role. What do you do if you have to meet an analyst? They saw you on the show and didn't like you. And now you have to win them over with our products. Ugh. So like these are real things yeah. that I'm asking. I'm doing extra interviews for these things. I had one job. They're like, we like you. You're exactly what we're looking for were too small. They were, I think probably like two, 250 people, if I remember correctly, like we're too small that if like something were to go wrong with what you're doing, or you were to get, you know, a a bad headline or something like we can't risk our company and our brand to be associated with that. Yeah. And that's why they pet. So it's like, and that, that's the stuff you wouldn't think about until you're in it. It's not in your peripheral. And my job was, was very supportive at first. Um, and, and, you know, part of the reason that I, you know, a contributing factor to my layoff was stuff related to the show that, and news articles and stuff like that for the very reasons I just said. But the, the challenge with that is, is you don't know really what the perception is going to be. I remember my CEO at the time was like, I, he's like, when I saw you on the show, I wanted to be really supportive. I was really scared that the Nick I know in real life, I wasn't going to see on TV. And I was super relieved when I saw the same guy on TV that I see, you know, in the office every day. And so, you know, so it's like, but you don't think about those things. Like imagine, imagine getting a bad edit and all of a sudden, you know, you're just like, your life is wrong. There were people people on on my season that got a bad edit. Totally. And on mine too, um, uh, on another farm, you know, there's a couple people who just got a bad edit and, and I spoke to those people personally and what, wh- how they were edited is not what happened with them either. You know, it's just not no. the true reality, but they needed to get this specific story out in a specific way. And that's just like, sorry, it had to be you, but that's you know? the priority. Yeah. 
as a priority. I think there needs to be a disclaimer of some sort before and after these shows reminding, maybe just taking, I don't know, a snippet out of the contract where they say we can misrepresent you, blah, 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 blah. And just put that and be like, hey, this is heavily edited. People may be misrepresented. People may be, uh, we may be telling a story that is you know, out of order or out of scenes or something. So people, at least in their mind, can watch and realize you're not watching an actual timeline of natural events. It's just not what happening in reality. And also- Pay me, you know, if you're going to, did you get, did you get paid? Nothing. I didn't even ask no. that. We don't get, paid. you got nothing? nothing. We get a per diem for food each day, but it was not enough for buying food in Canada. Well, I'm going to quit complaining about getting the minimal salary that we got. Yeah, we got Jeez, that's awful. And, I, and you know, and that's why they don't say your cast. They say your daters. They like are very, very particular about their wording of what they call you. And because you don't get meal contestants. Yeah. yeah. They do all this mealy mouth bullshit. Yeah, Cause they, they don't have to follow the, the labor laws of Canada when, when, when you're not a crew or, or cast an employee. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that has, that's one thing I think has to change is that you have to be, uh, I think you, when you go on reality TV, you should be treated as an employee. You should have the rights to meal breaks and, uh, and pay and overtime and all of that. Um, because you're, you are, you're taking time out of your life, your career to go make money for this big corporation and you're not benefiting in any way. So before we go, I, you know, I want to thank you again for coming on me this time. Is there anything that you want to ask me? Um, just how do you personally deal with the, the people who have lots of opinions about you that maybe are not true or just not very nice? You know, how do you separate yourself from public perception? You know, it's so funny because when I was going on this show and I've told this story before, so some people probably roll their eyes, but I, um, I kept thinking to myself, like, I have my core values. I know I'm a good person. I know I'm doing the right thing, but I don't really care what people think about me because of that. Then I remember shortly before the show came out or even maybe going on the show, I think it was after right, short, shortly before the show came out, I hear Joe Rogan say, I can't read the comments. People are too mean. And I'm like, Joe Rogan's like tough, fear factor, yeah. cage fighter, you know, most popular podcast ever. And he can't read the comments. And I started questioning yeah. everything. Um, <laughs> But you know what? What's interesting is like a lot of a lot of it at the beginning. I didn't really care. Um, it did start. It did start to to get to me as as like I lost my job and my marriage fell apart. Like all this stuff, my confidence took a hit, and that's when it started to kind of get to me. And it still it still does sometimes because it's again, it's like how, why is it so polarizing that I'm trying to help people and change something that's damaging and exploiting people? And that's the part. That's the part where it's like, I, why am I doing this sometimes? Because I'm just putting, I'm keeping myself out there. I want to be back in my normal life. I'm just keeping myself out there um, to this ridic this public ridicule. And so sometimes it still bothers me. I'm not going to lie. But I do try to just remind myself, like, Nick, when you are doing the right thing and you know you're doing the right thing, like, you are always, you, you're Teflon. You can take this because you just keep moving forward and you just keep doing the right thing. And that's are the you mindset. <laughs> I am. I am. I am. <laughs> I am. Yeah. And I just, I'm stubborn as fuck. I'm just as stubborn yeah. as any torch you've ever met. And I know I'm doing the right thing. I know this is the right thing to do. I know the time is now. So I just remind myself that. And I also just remind myself like people are damaged. People don't know what actually happened. They don't have to know what actually happened. Let them have their opinion. They don't yeah. know you. They don't know your relationship. They don't know your job situation. Um, and then the, the other thing is I, as I said earlier, I remind myself like, if someone's talking about me or leaving a nasty comment or a nasty DM, that's about them. Yeah. It's actually not about me. Cause yeah. if they actually wanted to inquire, they would ask to speak to me or they would ask a question. And yeah. when people do ask a question or people are like, this is what I thought, how is this not true? And they're like open to it. I'm more than happy to respond to that comment, respond to that DM, talk to that person and, and I think that's the way that like people come together and you hear each other, you listen to each other, you, you approach life with curiosity. Like I, I feel like if you 
approach life with curiosity and you always question why, and you say, if everyone's thinking this way, or if I'm presented this information, what are some other possible contributing factors? Or what happens if what I'm seeing isn't real? What happens if what I'm seeing is a predetermined message coming at me? And so I just, I forget other people don't do that. They don't look at the world the way that I look at the world and approach these things the way I approach some things with a critical eye. But I think that's important to remember because then you can kind of like disconnect reality from someone's perception of it that doesn't have any idea what they're talking about. Yeah. So, well, again, I want to thank you so much for coming on here. I don't know if you <laughs> want me to share your social media or anything, but if, if you do, where can people find you? Um, if you want to share your website or anything else that you've got going on and your TikTok. Yeah, I'm at official Lori B, I think is my Instagram. My TikTok is on hiatus right now. I'm taking a, taking a break from TikTok. Uh, and then my website is lauriebrownphotography.com. Amazing. And those links will all be in the description. So thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of Eyes Wide Open. If you enjoy the show, the best way to support us is by sharing or dropping a review. For more information and content, check out engagewithnick.com or find me on Instagram at nthompson513. Don't go through life blind. Do the work so you can show up in the world with your eyes wide open.